Welcome to paired t-tests, and actually a paired t-test is a special type of an ANOVA. It's a two-way ANOVA, I'm sorry, it's a one-way ANOVA with two levels with repeated measures. Basically you have, for example, you could have before-after measures for each subject and you want to test this before-after difference. Before we dive into this, make sure you're ready. Um, you really need to understand the concept of a residual from a linear regression in order to understand uh, what it is we're doing here with this paired t-test. And also you need to make sure you understand the two sample t-tests. This is uh, commonly run um, inappropriately for paired data. So go back and review the simple linear regression lecture if you forgot about residuals and if you're not super comfortable with the two sample t-test, yesterday's video was the two sample t-test three ways. So as I just said, a common mistake is to use a two sample t-test instead of a paired test. So if you ever have data such that multiple measures in your data are from the same subject. So for example, if you're measuring brain activation and you have um, brain activation maps for different points in time for each subject, then you need to use something that accounts for repeated measures. So this is a really special case because you have two measures for each subject and exactly two. If some subjects have two and some have one, you cannot use this. Everybody must have complete paired data. So I'm going to use a tire example. So they were testing how fast or how much tires wore out and each car had two tires. So this is an obvious case of paired data because you could imagine since these cars were all driven by different drivers that the wear and tear on the two tires might be similar because of the driver but what we're interested in is the tire difference. So we need to remove the automobile effect so that we can um, look at only the tire effect, tire A, brand A, and the other tire, brand B. And this is an interesting example. The reason I use it is because if you use a two sample t-test to test this difference, you'll get a p-value of 0.58, whereas the proper test, the paired t-test, will give you a p-value less than 0.001. So this is one of the, um, the few cases where doing the right thing will actually improve your p-value. Unfortunately, a lot of times I find when I'm uh, correcting people's errors that I make their p-values worse. But it doesn't matter, right? Because we're all just trying to do the right thing. But here's the case where the right thing is going to help you. So why are these two models, why do they give such different results? Well, here I've plotted the data in a bit of a weird way, but it's easier to visualize it this way. So I have each automobile along the x-axis, and the tire wear is along the y-axis. And I did tire A in pink and tire B in blue. So just eyeballing it, you can see these data clearly have a within automobile effect. But you can also see that there's an A versus B effect. So if I were to apply a two sample t-test to these data, what it does is it computes the mean of A and the mean of B. So if I take all the fuchsia points and average them, I get this top point here. If I take all of these blue points and average their tire weight wear values, I get this value down here. Um, I'm just, I've situated them along the x-axis here just to center it. Um, obviously this has nothing to do with tire 3 in specific, but this is the estimate for all cars, tire A. This is the estimate for all cars, tire B. So the difference between the mean A and mean of B looks right on target, just eyeballing it. That looks about the same, or not, it is the same as what we want, which is the average difference. So the difference, fine. The problem is the residuals are huge. We're using a really bad model. By that, what I mean, to see the residuals here, you have to compare the distance just moving straight up and down to the level of the other pink points from here. So here there's a big distance. The distance from here to this pink point, that's pretty big. The other ones are a little smaller. Um, likewise, the blue points have some pretty big differences. So the residuals are really big because we haven't accounted for the fact that each of these cars was driven by a different driver. 
So what the paired t-test does is it takes the data, and notice the y-axis has really changed. From here, the y-axis ranged between 8 to 13. So what I'm going to do is mean center each pair of points. So now it only ranges between negative 1 to 1. And you can see that we've centered the data for each subject. So that's the first step of the paired t-test, is mean centering each subject's data. And then, effectively, all you do is you apply a two-sample t-test to these data. So now the mean of A is here, mean of B is here. The difference is exactly the same. Remember the y-axis changed, but this distance here between A hat and B hat is exactly the same as, let me go back, this difference right here. It's just a different y-axis. So that didn't change. It's exactly the same. What's changing are the residuals. The residual variance is obviously much smaller because you can see as you look across, these are much more close to this point, and these are much more close to this point, which is the estimate of tire B. So that reduction in residual variance is what gives your p-value a little um, boost. And by boost, I mean it decreases it. So here's what that model looks like. So let's focus first on all these indicator variables out here. So beta 2 through beta 6 are modeling, those are doing the job of mean centering each pair of data. So it's modeling out the mean for car one, car two, car three, car four, car five. And once that's done, it looks like the picture I just showed where all of the points were centered about zero. And then beta one is what we're actually interested in. It's the difference. So importantly, we cannot carry out inferences on beta two through beta six. Um, it's not fair, say, you, say your cars were in two groups, um, I don't know, like an automatic and uh, manual transmission and you wanted to compare automatic to manual transmission, it's not fair to then uh, construct a contrast to do that mean comparison here because you have effectively overfitted the data. So you've artificially reduced the residual for that comparison. Um, Perhaps I'll cover that in more detail later, but just keep in mind, these are just nuisance. You're not modeling them in order to carry out inferences on them. It only sense, makes sense to model out the mean for each subject if we're interested in looking at this paired difference. So then the important thing is to focus on where the ones and minus ones are in this column. So since all the A's have a 1 and all the B's have a minus 1, that means this is um, beta 1 is the difference, specifically A minus B. So if I'm interested in the alternative A greater than B, that's equivalent to, again, we want to get a 0 on one side, A minus B greater than 0, so our contrast is 1, and then 5 zeros, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Uh, I think I have one too many zeros, but you get the idea. 1, 1, the rest zeros. And that's because that's all we need is just that beta 1. And again, um, if you want to test beta uh, b greater than a, uh, you would just take the negative of this contrast. So hopefully you have that. Um, go back and see if you can see the connection between this model and the third version of the two-sample t-test from last time. They actually look really similar. Um, give you a hint, you just look, they're very similar. Um, and just a reminder, the subject specific means are nuisance parameters. You shouldn't use those to build contrast to test group mean differences um, because the residuals artificially deflated for that comparison. Thanks, that's it. Uh, please don't forget to join the Facebook group, which is now at facebook.com slash groups slash Mumford Brain Stats. Don't bother with the, there's like another page thing that's too hard to comment on and stuff. So all the actions at the group, so join the group. All right, have a great day.